Thank you all for joining us today. Um, I'm Tuesday Sigma. For those of you who are over on the left-hand side here, make sure that you're at a table that has some um, um, papers on it. And if you're not, you might want to move or grab some papers. When you walked in, there was a stack of papers. Those are not what we'll be doing today, but something that you can take with you. So if you'll sit at a table that has some of the wellness wheels, that would be great. <laughs> Oh, and I'm Chen Brown. Good morning. For everyone who didn't pick up on that, in the, who didn't get that already. Yeah. So today we're here to talk about a systems approach to self care. We are um, glad to be with you all today to create a self self care plan for each of us individually, and to then also talk about us as a system at Caldwell Community College, how we can uh, work as a, as a team towards our own self-care institutionally. Today we're going to talk about some self-care planning, uh, the eight dimensions of wellness, and we're gonna work through that together and you'll create your own self-care plan. Uh, a little bit about systems care, understanding yourself, some challenges and some solutions to self-care. And we'll also go over some resources for you um, and also some that could be shared with students. So what is self-care? Self-care um, are activities and practices that each of us engage in on a regular basis that help to reduce our stress and maintain and uh, enhance our well-being. Does anybody recognize the image on the screen? What is it? Airplane mask. Yeah. Why do you think that we put this up on our screen? To breathe. To breathe. Yeah. It's a good reminder to breathe, right? And have some oxygen and get that into our lungs. Thanks for that reminder. <laughs> um, has anyone fallen before? Raise your hand. Okay. Great. Great. So the um, stewards or the, the flight attendant comes on and they're going through the routine and they say, in the unlikely event of an emergency, a mask like this will drop them from the ceiling. Um, fit your own mask first before assisting other passengers. How many times have we heard that and just go through the routine? Yeah, sure. So in um, the event of an emergency, we're going to fit our masks first. So when we're talking about self-care, we really need to focus on ourselves and what's going to work for us uh, before we're helping those around us. We can't help those around us if we're not getting the air and the oxygen to breathe ourselves first um, before we help others. So it's not something that we should um, to be for, that we should force ourselves to do. It's something that should come naturally to us. It should refuel us or recharge us. It looks different for everybody, um, and it's not selfish. It's um, it's something that we, we really need to take time and do for ourselves each and every day. So SAMHSA is the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Administration and they have what's called the eight um, dimensions of wellness. These are eight ways in which we can take action to improve our health. So you all have a sheet on your tables that have a wellness wheel on one side, and on the opposite side, it has the eight dimensions of wellness. As you look at the eight dimensions, you'll see that there is Social health, intellectual health, physical health, emotional health, environmental, occupational, spiritual, and financial. All of these encompass the whole realm of the eight dimensions of wellness. When we think about each of these items, um, we really need to be able as individuals to come up with a self-care plan which incorporates all eight dimensions or all eight areas. So we're going to take some time this morning in developing our own self-care plan. Again, we have to fit our own, own mask first 
before we can assist others. We all work here at the institution in our own capacity, and we help people each and every day. But if we're not knowing how to help ourselves first, it's gonna be really hard to be able to do our jobs. So we're gonna have, have the opportunity to do this right now in this space together. Um, if you do not have a wellness wheel on your table, Shannon or I can bring you one um, if you'll raise your hand. Okay, all right, we'll make our way over there. So what I would like for everyone to do is um, to think about each of these areas of wellness, each dimension. You've got some suggestions on the screen of items that you could fit into your self-care plan. Um, no, no one has to share their plan with anyone else here. This can be individual. If you feel comfortable sharing and talking around the table together about things that you're putting on your self-care plan, you never know, that might be something that someone else might want to consider as part of their wellness wheel. You can choose to add people, programs, or activities in each of these slots. So for instance, for um, social health, I may choose to put Shannon down as a person who can help with my social health. I may choose to put um, talking to a phone on the front, uh, talking with a friend on the phone on my individual social health. Does that make sense? Okay, so you'll have 10 minutes to create your own wellness wheel. Um, and you can add those items. You can write things that you're already doing, or you can write things that you would like to try to do, something that you would like to incorporate into your self-care plan. Any questions? Yes. I have one pen here, and hopefully if someone it does not have a writing utensil, maybe someone close to them would like to share. Yeah. We've got some coming around right now. Okay, so 10 minutes. Okay, we're going to call everybody back together. So does anyone feel comfortable sharing something that they put on their wellness plan? Um, we can start with the social um, social health. Does anyone feel comfortable sharing something they put on their social health? This may be something that someone else in the room um, may be able to put on their plan if that was an area they may have struggled putting something on. Yes. Lunch dates. I love that. Yeah. Be able to be in fellowship with one another. Yeah. Anything else <laughs> social? Yes, Bobby. Mine's backwards, but I'm in solitude. No, it's not. <laughs> That's okay. We're actually going to get there in just a little bit. <laughs> yeah. How about um, intellectual health? Something someone feels comfortable. April. That book that's on the coffee table? I'm sorry, can you say that one more time? Yeah, digging into some time to read a book. The one that maybe has been sitting there for a while that you really wanted to get to. Yeah, so carving out that time. Read one book per month. One book per month. I love that. You know how we teach kids we're like read 20 minutes a day. Um, we could, they come home with their little plans. You have to sign off on it every night as a parent. Isn't that just great um, that you have to sign off? Yeah. One opportunity we have at college is being in more groups like the book club or the movie club. You can attend those kind of groups whenever you can. And I guess good for intellectual as well as social. Absolutely. Thank you so much for sharing. Uh, how about physical health? Something that somebody wants to share for physical health. <laughs> Regular massages. <laughs> when we also have a massage therapy program here. Raise your hand. Josie says, raise your hand. Um, whoever said that. I'm a, I'm a therapist. <laughs> We've got some networking happening right here. Um, okay, Diane, I think you were going to say something.
Right. Yeah, so sleep is a part of our physical health. So we have to get an adequate sleep. I like that um, tip there. How about emotional health? Oh, sorry. Uh, I have one to add to physical. Um, I do a lot of hiking. So hiking? And I was just thinking about we could even do like group hiking because people are into that. I tend to just do a brown where I live. But I live. Oh, so Laura uh, is trying to incorporate a couple of different things. Group hiking, so some social um, along with uh, the physical health with the hiking. And, and emotional health. And emotional health. I went to yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's right. I like where we're going with this. They're all interconnected, right? Um, how about uh, emotional health? One more for that. Does anybody want to share something for emotional health? Yeah, Flora. So daily affirmations. Yeah, thanks for sharing. Oh. Um, environmental health. And then on that one, might be something we need to work on. Yeah, Richard. Uh, keeping a clean office space and uh, inviting office space and home, home space as well. Yeah, so an inviting space for everyone. Yeah. Um, occupational health. Planning for retirement. I love it. I love it. <laughs> yeah. And then the uh, last two are spiritual health and financial health. Does anyone have anything to share for uh, spiritual health? Yeah. Yeah, prayer, meditation. And how about financial health? Eat at home. Yeah, maybe bring your lunch, bring those leftovers to to work one day. Yeah, absolutely. So can you see how having a well-developed plan um, for your self-care in each of these domains can be beneficial for you? And how it's important that we don't focus on just one particular area. We, do, we think about mental health when we think about self-care and self-care planning, but it really is all of the dimensions of our wellness. And so I think it's important to have some go-tos for each of us with uh, the self-care planning. Thank you for taking the time to do that today. Um, hopefully you'll take that plan with you, maybe post it somewhere in your office where it can be a reminder of the things that you can do uh, day in and day out for your self-care. So I wanted to touch briefly um, on this pretty cobra cake up here that you all can see. Um, when we talk about our own self-care planning, I do think that it's important for us to think about the system. So the system in which we operate and the, and the system that we're all here today is uh, the college. As we were thinking about um, systems, it reminds me back to my social work background where we learned systems theory and that everything is interconnected. Um, think about this with this, this cake concept. So each of us are a different ingredient that we're bringing to the Cobra cake each and every day. As alone by ourselves, um, we're, we're just an ingredient, right? So we all have to have this interconnectedness. Um, the SPI director talked about a multidisciplinary team. Um, and I think that that's important when we're talking about our own self-care and we look at those dimensions of wellness, but we think about the interconnectedness that we all have together um, and what we bring to the table. That's, that's just a, a reminder to us all that the whole is greater uh, than the sum of its parts, or in this case, the ingredients to the Cobra cake. Right? So we're all pretty awesome in our in each individual selves, um, but bringing it all together I think it's important when we think about our self-care and our system, our system of care for one another. So in order to um, you know, have our own self-care plan and, 
and work together is um, really understanding ourselves, zooming in, so to speak, and also understanding others and zooming out. And we're going to talk a little bit about um, personality, uh, language of uh, appreciation, and um, our purpose. I'm going to hand it over to Shannon. Yeah, that's good. Um, I have to move so I can see it. So the first thing we'll talk about is the um, one that is child and true and that everybody's probably familiar with. I think probably everybody has taken their Myers-Briggs. You may automatically know off the top of your head your Myers-Briggs type. Um, if you don't, uh, I would encourage you to go ahead and find out. A lot of um, professional psychology people will uh, really kind of criticize and say it's a bunch of hooey and it's not random control, double blind, trial, blah, 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 blah. I find it useful to know your type. Um, and for those of you that haven't taken it, you can go on 16personalities.com. That's the number one six. 16personalities.com is a nice, uh, pretty accurate um, layman's assessment, I guess, that you can take. We also have over in our area um, that we use for career counseling here at the college, uh, Type Focus. And you can take the assessment with us through Type Focus online. And the cool thing about doing it through Type Focus is that it will provide you with um, feedback on the strengths that you bring, as Tuesday was talking about being within a system, it will, it will provide you with strengths that you bring in working with another person. So if you know your personality type and their personality type, it will tell you like where points of friction may be and where points of synergy might be so that you can really maximize the complementary parts of your personalities. So just to give you a really uh, broad, the things here in this left upper quadrant are essentially where we get our energy. This is the first letter of your personality profile, it's a four letter code. So where you get your energy, introvert versus extroversion. So if you're energized by being with people or not, you know, being with people, being alone, like I'll need a week after today to like recharge my battery, uh, I'm an introvert. Uh, the second one is where we get information or how we collect information from our environment. So there's sensing and intuition. Obviously sensors pay a lot of attention to things they can pick up and touch and hold, manipulate, intuitive, zoom out and get like a, a a thread or they pick up on patterns. Um, this quadrant down here between thinking and feeling is how we make our decisions with the information that we've collected. And the last um, section here, judgers and perceivers. These are not judgers like judgy people, but uh, that's just the word that they used um, when, they, when they developed this. But there's judgers and perceivers, and that's really how you structure your time. So whether you're, um, what you might loosely say as an OCD person would be a J person, everything's gotta be, you know, structured and timed and scheduled and everything has a place. And the uh, uh, P, the perceivers are folks that kind of roll with the punches a little bit more and may feel constricted by um, sharp timelines and it may actually drain energy from those folks. Um, I'm not gonna tell the joke I usually tell about J, N, and P, N, but I got one. So, <laughs> I'll skip that. Um, and also in reference to the Myers-Briggs, so that's the basic breakdown, but there is, it's so much more. It's really been um, researched and written about a lot. So if you are interested in the Myers-Briggs as a way of knowing yourself, uh, which is extremely important if you're talking about recharging your batteries, you really have to know like, what does it for you? Like where are your strengths? Where do you get your energy from? Um, you can look at these two letter codes. And again, we can make the PowerPoint available afterwards if you're interested in exploring this. And we have like some links and the speaker notes so that you can really kind of dig in if you're interested. Um, maybe you can read some of those um, based on these pairings. But it gets, you know, a lot more sophisticated about how you can really take care of yourself based on your two letter pairings. You can see what certain personality profiles have in, you know, in common. If you happen to be supervised by a person, for instance, who's the opposite of your personality profile, that can be stressful or complimentary. So just knowing uh, more about yourself is um, a good way to really start with a self-care, self-wellness plan. Um, we usually give the Myers-Briggs, well, we give it a lot in reference to career assessment and working with other people. So it's focused a lot about teamwork. So understanding another person's personality um, will help you work with that person, understand that person. But at this level, um, understanding yourself, it's extremely useful for that as well. Um, I alluded earlier to, if you use the type focus version, you can see about teams. Um, the next thing that we'll talk about, uh, is gonna cover a little bit more about, it's based on the, um, it's Gary Chapman, right? the love languages. And we had a presentation a couple years ago, if you were here then, where he did love languages in the workplace. 
So that one is a little bit more, so this is like really kind of micro about you. This is all about you right now. The next one with the love languages is relational. So it's about <laughs> understanding how people like to be appreciated and um, accommodating that appreciation. But even more so also for a wellness plan, understanding how you like to be appreciated. It's really nice if you can tell other people, this is the way I receive appreciation, you know, because not everybody wants the, the hat and the drum playing and the song on your birthday. Some people don't want that at all. Some people really don't want that. So um, understanding your love languages and how you like to be appreciated uh, is the next part of that. So who, who's familiar with Dr. Gary Chapman and the love languages? Just five, six, seven, eight, eight. Yeah. So we all have a primary way in which we receive and typically give uh, our appreciation. Mike Shannon said this is a good way of zooming out a little bit and working with others, is knowing a little bit more about, about your team and how people like to be appreciated. Um, they fall into five different categories. You just saw them there on the previous slide. Um, words of affirmation, um, quality time, acts of service, gifts, and touch. <coughs> In speaking the five languages of appreciation, this is a nice slide that um, talks about communication, actions, and then things to avoid with the languages of appreciation. So if the person is a words of affirmation um, receiver of, of the way that they um, like to be affirmed, compliments and affirmation and kind words uh, are received well. Sending notes or cards and things to avoid might be criticism as one example. You can see a little bit further quality time, one-on-one -on -one time with that individual is really um, important. That central concept is togetherness and, and being together. We talked about that a little bit on the wellness wheel in that social category. That someone who um, is really needing that quality time, they, they may gravitate towards more of that social aspect. Um, tangible gifts is, um, can be very small things that could be given as a token of appreciation for an individual. Doesn't have to be grandiose um, birthday cakes and, and balloons and all the gifts. It could be something uh, very small um, as a token of appreciation. Um, acts of service, how can I help you? What are some ways that I can help in um, the project that you're working on right now? Um, just acts of kindness, ways to avoid that or ignoring the employee's request or the way that um, while they're helping, while you're helping other people, so something to keep in mind. And then uh, physical touch gets a little bit tricky, uh, you know, in the workplace. <coughs> there are certain things that would be approved and, and not approved with physical touch, so we need to keep that in mind. Um, I'm always a proponent of there's power in touch, and that can be um, in a positive or a negative way. So I myself um, am a hugger, and I am, and I know that. I personally know that Shannon is not. <laughs> and so um, it's knowing the people that you work with and what ways in which that they are going to um, respond to that appreciation. One other way um, to kind of zoom out a little bit um, while zooming in, uh, People are familiar with Simon Sinek. He has um, the reference of the, what he calls the golden circle. And this goes back to our purpose and why we are here. Um, I think it's important for each of us individually to know our why, and that's the center of the bullseye here. A lot of us can tell you what we do each and every day. If someone asks you randomly, what do you do? You know, I'm going to say, oh, I'm a counselor. I work in our counseling department at the college. That's the what. Does that tell you anything about who I am? It might tell you a little bit, but it doesn't tell you who I am as an individual. Uh, if someone asks, you know, how do you do the job that you do? That's where you get a little bit of the meat and potatoes. Each of us do our job a little bit different. We're each individual and um, approach things differently. But it doesn't tell you why why we're here, um, what is our purpose. And I think we have to be a little bit introspective and think about our why and our purpose 
in order to then go out into um, our world, which here it's at the college, and, and work with others and, and be able to um, really work towards that greater good. You know, that cobra cake that I talked about a little bit earlier, all those ingredients going in together, our purpose, our why. That all formulates back to our um, plan for self-care. Shannon, you wanna talk about a little bit of our challenges or solutions? Yeah, I mean, I can, uh, does that work? Yeah, I mean, I'll allude a little, I mean, we will have challenges to our um, self-care. So in other words, if you kind all right, so let's say you did the Myers-Briggs, you do your love languages, and now you feel pretty good about it. I know how I'm appreciated. Um, I know like where I'm energized and I've got a plan. So, so now what? So like, what are the challenges? What gets in the way of you doing what you need to do? Sometimes it's as simple as not knowing your why. Some people really aren't sure why they're doing it. Or maybe their why is um, like, like we get nursing students sometimes who are like, um, I'm, my mom said it was a good career and I can make a lot of money. <laughs> Probably not the why we were looking for for our next group of nursing students. So your why, aligning your why with what you're doing on a daily basis is really a big source of energy. If you find for some reason though your why is um, muffled, right? You can't get, you can't meet your why with what you're doing in your daily day-to-day -day work. That's a huge strain on your wellness, right? You're going to feel that at your core because that's where your why lives. Your why is like the reason you do all your stuff. So if what you're doing isn't really supporting your core, that's like taking the fuel out of your candle, right? You got a little bit of oxygen, but no fuel, so your candle's gonna go out if you're not feeding your why. What are some other um, challenges that people just, you, know, you can popcorn it or raise your hand or whatever, like what are some other things that might get in the way of self-care, maybe for, for people you've seen, maybe not for you, but you saw another person who didn't take care of themselves. What, what do you think might have gotten in the way of that for, for you or for other folks, anybody? Um, sometimes you get caught up in what you think is supposed to be self-care and it isn't actually good for you. Yeah, yeah. Like, uh, I don't know, recreational chemicals come to my mind. <laughs> you know? <laughs> I'm stressed, I'm gonna kick back a few. That might be an impediment to your self-care. Other, yeah. Caring for others, absolutely. Compassion fatigue, it's huge among caregivers. Um, because you're getting one why met, you need to be a caregiver. Uh, but sometimes uh, if it's out of balance, uh, then the imbalance, well, I mean, we see that in our area too, right? So um, lots of good writing on the wounded healers. You know, what, what is it uh, that pulls a person towards caring for other people? And so maybe that answers your why, but in, out of balance is definitely in the way of self-care. Scrolling. 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 Yes. Yeah. Doom scrolling. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Caring too much about what other people, the life that they're painting on Instagram. It's not real, probably. I like the 15 second videos. You just can keep, going, keep going, going and going. Yeah. Yeah. Go down the rabbit hole. Time management. Oh. Time. Time. Yeah. Other barriers to self care. Ego. Say more about that. I have a family member who um, just didn't think it was, um, he thought it was weakness to share um, mental distress. Yeah. And so once once we realized that, we spoke with them and they're getting help now. But Absolutely. Before, their, their ego would keep in the way of, of getting help. That's a perfect segue yeah. to a video. Yeah. Don't you think? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so you get a break from hearing us clamor. We're going to play a short video uh, on cynicism, actually, and um, what happens sometimes with self-care. In certain quarters, cynicism has a distinct kind of glamour. It sounds pretty tough not to have too many hopes and to claim to be able to see through the dreams of others. Cynics will tell you that everyone is selfish and weak, that the system is 
rigged and driven by greed, that you could never succeed, so it's pointless and contemptible to try, that all ideals are ridiculous, and that do-gooders are only out to show off their own supposed virtues. It's hopeless to try to disprove cynicism. There will always be an abundance of vivid examples to back up a catastrophic interpretation of humanity. But what identifies people as cynics is not so much what they claim as why they do so. Their downbeat assessments are based not on a dispassionate analysis of our species, but on an inner emotional compulsion. Their philosophy is, first and foremost, a defense against suffering. Beneath their gruff surface, cynics are afflicted by a near hysterical fragility around the idea of expecting anything which turns out to be less impressive than they'd hoped. And so they twist their mental apparatus to secure themselves against the eventuality of any discouragement. They disappoint themselves before the world can ever do it for them at a time and in a manner of its own choosing. Cynics may look like people trying very hard to see the facts as they are, but in truth, they are trying even harder to insulate themselves against pain. The origin of their stance is not worldly experience and insight. It is, rather more poignantly, psychological trauma. Somewhere in the past, there will probably have been a blow to their hopes that felt too powerful to handle. Sadly, though, cynics don't give away the slightest clue as to their touching and vulnerable backstories. They will instead talk stridently about corruption and manipulation, pile up ample examples of greed, and proffer complex-sounding theories about economics. But what they won't do is voluntarily or easily reveal how their father humiliated them when he was drunk, or how it felt when their mother ran away to another city when they were just five. The cynic is never truly and completely cynical. They are still recovering from hopes that grew too painful to avow. A natural temptation when encountering a cynic is to try to argue them out of their attitude by citing counterexamples. But this is in its own way cruel, because it misunderstands what cynicism is about. It is an emotional protection, in essence, a mode of coping learned under conditions of duress. What the cynic really needs, and yet fears they may never get, so naturally never asks for, is kindness. A kindness that may eventually help them to rekindle their stunted, secret desires for hope and fulfillment. Okay, that hits close to home for me. I'll do a little self-disclosure. I battle cynicism a lot, an awful lot. Um, and I think probably the more idealistic you are, the more easy it is to get let down, right? So uh, a note about that, at the time, back to what you said, a lot of times how we believe we're gonna be received by other people or the support that we think we're gonna get in our environment. Really Tourists. Tourists that turn into scientists. Tourists taking photos that are analyzed by AI. So researchers can help life underwater. I'm sorry. It's okay. You're being received well by me. So, I, yeah. So, I mean, how you believe you're going to be received by other people when you ask for support, or if you acknowledge a vulnerability, um, and that idea about being vulnerable is so taboo in our culture right now that um, people just a lot of times really can't do it when they need to, and that's part of self-care is being able to be vulnerable. Um, I don't think in the um, playlist that was on when you came in, we got to it, but there's a Drew Holcomb song, You Gotta Know Your People. And um, it's that same idea. You gotta find the people that connect you and that, that you feel safe with, the people that you trust, in order to be vulnerable, because that's really a huge part of wellness, is a willingness to be vulnerable. And you may not be vulnerable with everybody. You're not gonna be, that would be some kind of pathology probably. But, you know, you gotta find your people. You gotta know your people and um, take time to be vulnerable with those people and to be honest with yourself when your battery's low and when you really need something because otherwise you're gonna end up with that kind of sharp, jagged cynicism which really, as we're talking about systems of care, um, echoes out, it reverberates out. So where there's one cynic, you're probably growing others around you, right? If you're that cynic, it's a seed, just like you can be a seed of compassion. So 
it is all connected, as Juzi talked about with this ingredient, you know, making the cake, part of that self-care, you can really begin to create a culture that then grows new seeds and echoes. If you're vulnerable with one person, they're much more willing to be vulnerable with you, which then leads to better self-care for them and better self-care for you. It builds um, supportive relationships, which then hopefully echo out. You know, once somebody's had a positive experience with being vulnerable, they didn't get slapped back, there's a much, much more likely that they're gonna do it again, that people are gonna be willing to be vulnerable in an appropriate, healthy way, and then receive, if you know their um, love language at work, and then receive the support um, that you can offer them that's coming to them. So that's another big part of self-care. Yeah. So what are some solutions to self-care that everybody can um, dip popcorn style, things that can be a solution? Shannon just gave some. Is, are there any others? Yeah, and, and I'm going to say on that too, like a list, like, like you're doing a plan. Um, I don't want to steal somebody else's answer, but like I've got 10 things on my list today. What you asked me to do is really important, but i got to move something else off of this, right? So priorities on that list, getting your plan and then sticking to it. And if it means something's got to slide off of your to-do list, then you slide it, you know, if something's more important. And communicating that yeah. effectively to whoever it is that you're going to have to wait on that one thing because this has now risen to the top of the list. Yeah. And just dovetailing off what April said, I would say judging yourself, forgiving yourself, um, being able to do that and recognize that we're all just people. Yeah. And if you can do that for yourself, it, you can really expand it out to, to others. Yeah, that positive self-talk and then reverberating that out outward to others. Yeah. We're our own worst, aren't we? <laughs> We tell us things in our head that we would never say to a friend. Um, so thank you for that reminder. How, how about if you fall in prey cynicism and you're uh, grabbing and you know, complaining about something at work, what might be, if it's really pressing on you, what might be a thing that you could do, a solution to help relieve your stress? Talk to a counselor. <laughs> you, you could talk to a counselor. You, you could talk to anybody. Yeah. Well, like, Just know, taking initiative, right? Can I say something about this? So when I'm at work, sometimes, okay, not all the time, but sometimes you're trying to have a good day, somebody else is coming up and griping about something. And it's probably something maybe you hear on a regular basis, and maybe it's something that you know there's nothing that's going to be done about this. It's the same old gripes I've had forever. And I'm kind of trying yeah. to protect my own self a little bit, and that's, I'm just throwing that out there, that we maybe need to, yeah, we need to know when we talk to people, but also about what, because some things are just these issues that we just have to like, okay, this is here, it's gonna be here, but I'm gonna have a good day, and what I can make the changes that I can, or, you know what I mean? Like, we gotta be conscious of what we're putting out to other people, too, and then what we're letting in. Yeah, what can we do right here in this moment? Yeah. And if that's some big philosophical type of thing, that might not be, the, you know, the action plan for right here and right now. Yeah, I think that's a good reminder. And I think it's okay to say to somebody, gosh, yeah, that seems like a really big problem. I'm really trying to focus today on these things. <laughs> I appreciate you bringing it to my attention, but this, let's, you know, let's talk about something else, kind of changing the subject there. That kind of bumps up against the prayer of serenity, right? Like yeah. being clear about what you have control over and what you don't. And then if you don't have control over it, who does? Can you bump it up to somebody? Can you refer it out? 
but being very clear that that's really not in your, it's not your surface, right? Yeah. 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 On that note, just, I'm sure you all know, but therapy is no copay to state. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. good point. Yeah. We're going to hit that resource again at the end. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. There are these two young fish swimming along and they happen to meet an older fish swimming the other way, who nods at them and says, morning boys, how's the water? And the two young fish swim on for a bit, and then eventually one of them looks over at the other and goes, what the hell is water? The point of the fish story is merely that the most obvious, important realities are often the ones that are hardest to see and talk about. Stated as an English sentence, of course, this is just a banal platitude. But the fact is that in the day-to-day -day trenches of adult existence, banal platitudes can have a life-or-death importance. The plain fact is that you graduating seniors do not yet have any clue what day in, day out really means. There happen to be whole, large parts of adult American life that nobody talks about in commencement speeches. One such part involves boredom, routine, and petty frustration. The parents and older folks here will know all too well what I'm talking about. By way of example, let's say it's an average adult day, and you get up in the morning, go to your challenging white-collar college graduate job, and you work hard for eight or ten hours, and at the end of the day you're tired and somewhat stressed, and all you want is to go home and have a good supper and maybe unwind for an hour and then hit the sack early, because of course you have to get up the next day and do it all again. But then you remember there's no food at home. You haven't had time to shop this week because of your challenging job. And so now, after work, you have to get in your car and drive to the supermarket. It's the end of a work day, and the traffic is apt to be very bad. So getting to the store takes way longer than it should. And when you finally get there, the supermarket is very crowded. Because, of course, it's the time of day when all the other people with jobs also try to squeeze in some grocery shopping. But you can't just get in and quickly out. You have to wander all over the huge, overlit stores, confusing aisles to find the stuff you want. And you have to maneuver your junky cart through all these other tired, hurried people with carts, et cetera, et cetera, cutting stuff out because it's a long ceremony. And eventually, you get all your supper supplies, except now it turns out there aren't enough checkout lanes open, even though it's the end of the day rush. So the checkout line is incredibly long, which is stupid and infuriating, but you can't take your frustration out on the frantic lady working the register, who is overworked at a job whose daily tedium and meaninglessness surpasses the imagination of any of us here at a prestigious college. But anyway, you finally get to the checkout line's front, and you pay for your food, and get told to have a nice day in a voice that is the absolute voice of death. And then you have to take your creepy, flimsy plastic bags of groceries in your cart with the one crazy wheel that pulls maddeningly to the left, all the way out through the crowded, bumpy, littery parking lot, and then you have to drive all the way home through slow, heavy, SUV-intensive rush hour traffic, etc., etc. Everyone here has done this, of course, but it hasn't yet been part of your graduate's actual life routine, day after week, after month, after year. But it will be. And many more dreary, annoying, seemingly meaningless routines besides. But that is not the point. The point is that petty, frustrating crap like this is exactly where the work of choosing is going to come in. Because the traffic jams and crowded aisles and long checkout lines give me time to think. And if I don't make a conscious decision about how to think and what to pay attention to, I'm going to be pissed and miserable every time I have to shop. Because my natural default setting is the certainty that situations like this are really all about me. About my hungriness and my fatigue and my desire to just get home. And it's going to seem for all the world like everybody else is just in my way. And who are all these people in my way? And look at how repulsive most of them are and how stupid and cow-like and dead-eyed and non-human they seem in the checkout line. Or at how annoying and rude it is that people are talking loudly on cell phones in the middle of the line and look at how deeply, personally unfair this is. If I choose to think this way in the store and on the freeway, fine, lots of us do. Except thinking this way tends to be so easy and automatic that it doesn't have to be a choice. 
It is my natural default setting. It's the automatic way that I experience the boring, frustrating, crowded parts of adult life when I'm operating on the automatic, unconscious belief that I am the center of the world and that my immediate needs and feelings are what should determine the world's priorities. The thing is that, of course, there are totally different ways to think about these kinds of situations. In this traffic, all these vehicles stuck and idling in my way. It's not impossible that some of these people in SUVs have been in horrible auto accidents in the past and now find driving so terrifying that their therapist has all but ordered them to get a huge, heavy SUV so they can feel safe enough to drive. Or I can choose to force myself to consider the likelihood that everyone else in the supermarket's checkout line is just as bored and frustrated as I am and that some of these people probably have much harder, more tedious or painful lives than I do. Again, please don't think I'm giving you moral advice or that I'm saying you're supposed to think this way or that anyone expects you to just automatically do it because it's hard. It takes will and effort. And if you are like me, some days you won't be able to do it or you just flat out won't want to. But most days, if you're aware enough to give yourself a choice, you can choose to look differently at this fat, dead-eyed, over-made-up lady who just screamed at her kid in the checkout line. Maybe she's not usually like this. Maybe she's been up three straight nights holding the hand of her husband who's dying of bone cancer. Or maybe this very lady is the low-wage clerk at the motor vehicles department who just yesterday helped your spouse resolve a horrific, infuriating red tape problem through some small act of bureaucratic kindness. Of course, none of this is likely, but it's also not impossible. It just depends what you want to consider. If you're automatically sure that you know what reality is and who and what is really important, if you want to operate under default setting, then you, like me, probably won't consider possibilities that aren't annoying and miserable. But if you really learn how to think, how to pay attention, then you will know you have other options. It will actually be within your power to experience a crowded, hot, slow, consumer hell type situation as not only meaningful, but sacred. On fire with the same force that lit the stars. Love, fellowship, the mystical oneness of all things deep down. Not that that mystical stuff's necessarily true. The only thing that's capital T true is that you get to decide how you're going to try to see it. This, I submit, is the freedom of real education, of learning how to be well-adjusted. You get to consciously decide what has meaning and what doesn't. That is real freedom. That is being educated and understanding how to think. The alternative is unconsciousness, the default setting, the rat race, the constant gnawing sense of having had and lost some infinite thing. I know that this stuff probably doesn't sound fun and breezy or grandly inspirational the way a commencement speech is supposed to sound. What it is, as far as I can see, is the capital T truth with a whole lot of rhetorical niceties stripped away. You are, of course, free to think of it whatever you wish. But please don't just dismiss it as some finger-wagging Dr. Laura sermon. None of this stuff is really about morality or religion or dogma or big fancy questions of life after death. The capital T truth is about life before death. It is about the real value of a real education, which has almost nothing to do with knowledge and everything to do with simple awareness. Awareness of what is so real and essential, so hidden in plain sight all around us all the time, that we have to keep reminding ourselves over and over, this is water. This is water. So as we think about our self-care plan, think about this is what. Think about how um, each, every action that we take for our self-care plan in turn is part of our whole self-care plan together. We do want to briefly touch on some upcoming opportunities for more of the same of what we've got going on today. Um, 
On the Caldwell campus, we are going to have Let's Talk Tuesdays um, uh, starting next Tuesday between um, 11 and 1 in the library. Um, we are going to have Student Wellbeing and When to Refer. That went out to, um, I think, faculty and staff by Nancy Rich. It's also on our professional development webpage. Be up in Watauga on September 11th, on the Caldwell campus on the 13th, and virtually on the 14th. So, more information on that. Um, our Resilience Academy is up and going. We have had great success and um, great participation in that. Our next one in Watauga is going to be September the 20th, um, and then in Hudson on September the 27th, and those are both in the noon hour in E120, <clears throat> and I'm not sure about the Watauga campus, the student commons in the Watauga, on the Watauga campus, and then we will be having some mental health first aid upcoming dates. Um, be on the lookout on in, in your email for those opportunities for professional development related to assisting those who are uh, developing a mental health problem or experiencing a mental health crisis. And then last but not least, we've got some resources for you on your tables. There are some cards, so we encourage you to take those with you. Those are 988 cards. It's a good resource to have on your person in case you happen to come across someone who may be experiencing a mental health problem. Um, that is the new line that you can call directly, just 988, just like you would with 911, and be connected to someone, um, and it, it's there for you all. Um, as it was already mentioned, our EAP, there's the number for um, my group, the State, state, health, state health Plan, that is of, of no cost, so please, we encourage you to take advantage of, of that, and then if you have any other questions for us, we are um, available and willing to talk with you about anything on the subjects that we've, we've talked about today and further. And we really appreciate you taking the time and joining us today and um, I know that we are what keeps you between um, this and lunch and so I want to be aware of that time but are there any um, questions that we can answer? Okay, thank you so much for being with us today. Find, find a buddy to help you make sure your self-plan gets, gets enacted. Find a buddy at your table to ask you next week, what's one thing you've done on your self-care plan?